We can't wrap our minds around His grace. We can't begin to comprehend the depth of your love. But God, we praise you this morning. We thank you that you chose, because of your great love for us, to give us your Son, Jesus Christ, who hung on the cross to pay the price for our sins, the price that we deserve. God, it's a shudder to think of where I would be if it were not for Jesus Christ. And uh, I know that that is the testimony of those here who know you. You've changed us. You've transformed us. You've taken us from a path of death, a path of emptiness, a path in which we were enslaved by sin. You've taken us from that path and you've transformed us and put us on a path to new life. And we praise you for that. And God, uh, help us this morning to just catch a glimpse of the, of the awe of that, of the depth of that. May we never lose sight. And never become callous to what you have done. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. I want to begin by reading a passage from Acts chapter 12. Listen closely along with me as I read this, because I want to begin our time in God's Word a little bit differently this morning. Um, kind of picking up in the middle of a thought, but I think we'll get to the point here. Uh, this is Acts chapter 12, verse 1. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Uh, picture, picture what's going on here. You're the church 2,000 years ago. Picture this. Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread, and when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. Listen to this. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. And if you know the rest of the story, you know that God miraculously released Peter from prison. And he came to the door of those who were praying, and, and they were surprised, they were shocked that there he was standing there. I love that phrase. Earnest prayer was being lifted up on behalf of Peter. What I want to do this morning is something a little bit different. I want you to look just quickly at the person on your left and the person on your right. Just look there. Make a mental note of who that person is. If there's nobody to one side of you, look a couple, look at, look at the row over. I want to begin our time this morning with prayer. But I want us to pray for each other. Because we're not in prison in a physical sense. We're certainly no longer, if we know Christ, enslaved to sin. But it's likely that the person beside you, to your left or your right, is in some sort of chains. We don't know what they are. Maybe it's a chain of, I just want to be a people pleaser. Maybe it's a chain of, I just feel empty. Maybe it's a chain of, maybe there is a sin that you feel like you're enslaved to. We don't know what they are. But I'll tell you what made a difference in the New Testament church, because this is not the exception. This is the rule. Earnest prayer being lifted up on behalf of the saints. And so I just want to remember that person to your left and to your right. And every person here who knows Jesus Christ, would you lift up earnest prayer for the people beside you? That God would just speak to our hearts. That He would remove those chains. That He would fill us with His Spirit in a, in a new and powerful way. Whatever it is that God lays on your heart, to pray for that person beside you. Let's pray together. 
trip for eight days, uh, but uh, uh, here I, I think here's the answer to, to the question, how was the trip? Um, I, I, I thought of this many times during the week, that uh, sometimes pastors go to um, pastors' conferences in order to uh, get a glimpse of what God wants to do in the church. And, and pastors' conferences are great, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, being critical of those. Uh, but sometimes, as pastors, we just kind of get to the place where, God, what do you want uh, us to look like? How does this play out? What does it look like practically? And so we'll take a weekend or, or a week and, and, and break away and, and hear those in the know who tell us how the church is supposed to function. And so sometimes we go to pastors' conferences, um, but here's the answer to the question. I went to El Salvador. And I'll tell you what, I am fired up about... Um, what God has in store for the church. Um, it was a, 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 a fringe benefit, I don't know how you word it, that I did not anticipate. We went there uh, to evangelize. We went there to bring the gospel to people. And I'm going to share some of that uh, this morning. And so I fully expected that uh, today I'd, be coming, I'd stand up here and share with you how excited I was about the opportunity to bring the gospel. And I am. Uh, but what I did not expect was to learn so much about the New Testament church. And uh, I just, uh, I, you've heard this joke perhaps, and I just, I, I, I don't want to be critical this morning. That's not my intention. I want to encourage us because I came back with, God, we have so much potential. There is so much that you want to do in us as a body, and there's so much that you've already begun to do, and I see the workings of that beginning, but just there's so much more, God, that I just wasn't even aware of. And you've heard this joke before. It's a corny joke, but I think it'll make the point. Um, a man um, uh, goes into the store and buys a chainsaw. And uh, he's going to clear a big portion of his land. And he goes up to the land, and he's cutting all day with this chainsaw. And he's beat. He's just, he's just dead tired. Thought that this was going to be a much easier job than it was. And he really didn't even get that much done. And he goes into the store at the end of the day, and he says, I've got a complaint. He said, I've been working all day. You said this chainsaw would cut so many cords. And, and I barely got two trees down. And I'm just beat. And uh, the guy says, well, take it over here. And he pulls it and he grabs it and puts it up on the bench. And then he starts it up. And it starts rapping and roaring. And the man says, what is that noise? <laughs> he didn't know that the chainsaw actually had an engine that, and he was just kind of working at it all day long, uh, cutting. And uh, I, I, I feel like that today. Yes. I feel like um, the church, and again, I don't mean this in a critical way. I mean this in an encouraging way. I hope that this morning as we look at God's Word that you will be as encouraged as I was. I feel like we have been a chainsaw that is just yet to be pulled. And that God has so much more for us as a body, uh, individually, but, but, but corporately. That He wants to do in and through us. And um, so I'm excited about it. What I want to do this morning, go ahead and turn your Bibles um, to a, a couple of things. I always forget that it's Communion Sunday, and so I am going to just get as much information uh, out as I can uh, today. Uh, we're going to pick up on it in the, in the weeks that follow, and uh, I may be a bit scattered because I've just got so much that I want to share with you this morning, and it's in some form of uh, order here, but uh, um, I'm going to do the best I can. I want to tell you um, two things that... Um, challenge me. I, I, I want to tell you about my trip, but I don't want to just spend the whole morning telling you about the trip, because I want to share with you the Word of God and how it relates to the trip. Um, but there are two things that stood out to me um, in these eight days. Um, first of all, the country of El Salvador. Uh, or if you're in El Salvador, it's El Salvador. I learned that. They don't actually say me. Um, uh, but uh, it's El, Sal El Salvador. The, the country itself blew me away from the standpoint of their receptivity to the gospel. Had no idea. I have said to my wife so many times, I just want to go somewhere where you open up the Word of God and you start to tell people about Jesus and they actually want to hear it because that doesn't exist here in the United States except in just tiny little pockets. Um, it, 
it, we found the place. It's El Salvador. And so many times I said to myself, oh, I just wish I could just transport the whole congregation here uh, so they can catch a glimpse of what God is doing uh, in El Salvador. So the country itself, the receptivity of the gospel, blew me away. Uh, but what I did not expect was the church that hosted us. Um, uh, this uh, church that we went to and we talk about, but it was called we are heavens, hence the, the shirt that I'm wearing this morning. That was the name of their church. And we pulled up in the city, um, uh, just, I mean, not what you think of it. It didn't look anything like this. It was a former macaroni and cheese, uh, uh, macaroni factory. And uh, so it was just a big warehouse and very rough and uh, uh, just uh, um, uh, just very different kind of a setting than uh, I've ever been to with regards to a church. But the church that hosted us, I pulled up and I saw on the wall outside, and of course every building there has a huge steel gate that you swing over at night, and then there's a passage door in the gate that you go through um, to get in now. You keep, everything's locked up uh, with a, a key and a lock and key at night. Uh, but on the wall, it said, we are happy. And, and I gotta tell you, my, my first response to that was, wow, that's, I, I feel a little uncomfortable with that. It's a little presumption. We are heaven. Um, because heaven is heaven. And, and this is earth. And, uh, and, and, but I'll tell you what. Um, after spending a week with those believers in El Salvador, I can't think of a better name. I cannot think of a better name. Because it was a little piece of heaven in El Salvador. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. First, I want to talk about the country. Because I, want to, I think you'll be so excited about... Uh, I'm going to tell you some of the things we did on a typical day. We got up Monday morning, and we went to a public school, okay? We were packed full from morning till night every day. Um, uh, public school. Went in, and uh, this was with uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, was the group that we went with, and it was a soccer team that Lizzie plays with. And so the idea was to start soccer games, and then sit the people down, the kids down, and share Jesus with them. I go, well, that, well, that may be a little bit effective, because I'm thinking of the United States. We would go in in a public school and meet with the principal and say, hey, we're here from the United States. We want to um, play soccer with your kids. We want to talk about Jesus. I mean, we didn't hide anything. Sure. They would literally drop everything. Drop everything. Kids, get out to the recess. Get out to the field. And we would play soccer. I didn't play, but they would play soccer with them and get completely demolished by the El Salvadorians. <laughs> who, that's all they do is play soccer. Um, and then we'd sit them down and share the gospel with them. And as we walked out of the school, the principal would say, come back anytime you want. It was incredible. It was unbelievable. And yet we are the developed country, right? We're the ones who have it all together. We can't, we can't even talk about Jesus. We can't pray in schools. We, one of the, I'm going to tell you just some of the highlights. Um, the um, third day that we were there, I think it was, we went to a park, a huge park. And uh, there were people playing uh, soccer, of course, soccer fields all over the place. There were a band uh, practicing their instruments, and they just, just everybody kind of scattered all over the place. And I had a translator with me. His name was David. And I said, David, I'm just going to follow your lead because um, this is your country, and you know how things work. And I'm so glad that I did that because um, David took me, first of all, to a group of uh, older gentlemen who were just kind of sitting around um, killing time. And um, we engaged in conversation with them and uh, shared the gospel with them. Not, not real uh, responsive, but just a great opportunity. Um, as you talk, people kind of gather around a little bit more, whereas in the United States, as you talk, the group gets smaller. Um, but then David looked, as we finished talking with them, David said, let's go over to that um, marching band. All right, they're practicing. They're playing their instruments. And he says, let's go over there. And we go over to this marching band. And I don't know what David is saying, but I come to find out. He says, this is a pastor from the United States. And he wants to talk to your kids about Jesus. And the marching band instructor says, see, see, see. And these kids, I don't remember if they sat down or stood, but I shared with them. And I want to tell you, um, I'll tell you briefly what I would share typically, depending on the age of the kids. Um, because it was just so, so cute sometimes to see their receptivity and the response. I started out with, um, how many of you know what a spanking is? <laughs> and um, a spanking. Oh, spanking. Yeah. Spanking. A spanking. 
You never have a spanking day? Uh, that's what I thought you would say, but I wasn't sure. A spanking. I don't know a lot of things, so sometimes words mean something else. No, it's a spanking. What? I have them every day, lots of them, every single day. Uh, so these kids would kind of sheepishly raise their hands. They don't want to admit that they know what spanking is. So then I'd ask them, uh, how many of you ever got a spanking? And then they kind of look around and they raise their hand. And then I said to them, well, when I was your age, um, I was very, very bad. And on one occasion, this little boy who was just into it from the beginning, I said, when I was your age, I was very, very bad. He goes, like me, like me. <laughs> and he was so excited to find that um, common ground with me. And uh, I said, I got spankings every day, lots of them. But I told him the story very briefly. Uh, one time, I stole some candy, and I lied about it. And uh, my dad found out, and he said to me, uh, Rusty, you're going to get a spanking. And it's going to be a very big one. And these kids were just captivated. Um, because the next line was that uh, my sister was very, very sad. Of course, you're talking to an uh, translator, interpreter. And uh, um, she didn't want me to get a spanking because I got so many of them. And so she asked my dad if he would spank her instead. And these kids were just in awe. And I would ask them, so do you ever brother? this? Would you ever take his spanking? No way! No way! And, and I'd say, did you know that that's what Jesus did for us? And these kids just, they, 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 couldn't, they, couldn't, they couldn't get enough of it. And, 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 and you share the rest of the gospel and, and, and the scriptures that apply to it. And is there anybody here who would, who would want to have their sins forgiven and, and want to have uh, their hearts given uh, to Jesus Christ and, and, and every hand in the group? I mean, and it was just like that over and over again. And so let me finish. And um, the instructor who I'm wondering, okay, did I step over the bounds here? Um, he goes over to the translator and he speaks to him who then speaks to me and says, thank you so much for bringing this news to these kids. And it was like that every single day. Every single day. We went from there, you left that group, went over to this soccer team that was sitting in a circle getting their final instructions from their coach. And he says the same thing. Here's a pastor from the United States. He wants to talk to your kids about Jesus. Great, great. And we just shared the gospel with 20 kids sitting on the ground. And every single day, it was the same exact thing. Um, it was Friday. I went out with a different translator. And uh, um, we went over to a, uh, a group of kids who were uh, getting instruction for a rollerblading. Because it was a rollerblading track here. And uh, now David wasn't with me, but he had set the pace for me. And I said, well, I'm going to ask this instructor if we could talk to his rollerblading team. And uh, he said, well, he said through the translation, you need to ask the moms. And all the moms were sitting there waiting for their kids to finish up with the class. And all the moms just start shaking their head and smiling. And so I'm sharing this gospel, and it's about hell, and it's about sin. And I'm literally thinking to myself, well, these moms, how are they going to respond to that? And I look past the kids at the moms, and when you get to the, the hardest stuff, the moms are looking at their kids and they're smiling, like as if to say, thank you for telling my kids this. And it was just an incredible experience every single day with people that just wanted to hear the gospel and adults who were so very thankful. We spent another afternoon at a skater's bar, uh, skateboarders and so on, and um, uh, did something a little bit different on that day where I had a, 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 a white board and you may have seen um, the, uh, oh, that looks nice. <laughs> that looks really nice. I don't, does anybody have a right, do you No, no. That's right. I, I, I actually brought a board. And you may have seen the Navigator's um, uh, example of uh, a, a, a kind of a cliff here, and then a cliff over here with a, with a, a gap in between. And, um, uh, we are over here, man is over here, and, and God is over here. And, and sin, of course, is, is in the gap. Sin separates us from God. Uh, but God sent uh, Jesus down, and, and you draw a picture of the cross, and it bridges the gap in the, in the chasm there. And I spoke with these four um, kids, uh, maybe 18, 19 years old, who were skateboarders, and uh, just captivated. 
I mean, didn't take their eyes off me. And then asked a few questions, and, and uh, um, I gave each one of them the opportunity. And this is a hard thing to do, because I don't believe in the effectiveness of a sinner's prayer. Okay? And let me explain what I mean by that. There's no, nothing magic about a prayer. And a lot of people in the United States have said a prayer and think they're on their way to heaven because they said a prayer. And it's not about a prayer, and it's not about thinking about it. It's not about some magic potion that, that, or formula that happens. It's about you and I accepting God's gift of forgiveness and, 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 and at the same time repenting of sin so that God can take away our old heart and put inside of us a new heart. And so it's very difficult. You want to give people an opportunity to respond, but it's very difficult to kind of reduce that down and, and without dumbing it down. And so I spoke with these kids, and I just, these four kids, I just, I wanted to make it as clear as I possibly could. Listen, God doesn't want your good deeds. He doesn't want your prayer. He wants your heart. That's what he wants. He wants to take out your old heart, and he wants to put a brand new heart in you. And, 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 and I, I, I tried to make it as clear and, and as, 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 as you know, biblically accurate as I could. And these four kids, I'm ready. I want to give him my heart. It was you think that you kind of have to dump it down and to make it so that they would respond to it, but I made it kind of as hard as I could, you know, in, in being accurate with the scriptures. And all four of them, yes, we want that. I want that. And then I finished talking with them, and 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 one of them looked me right in the eyes and said, "Thank you." Nobody talks to us about these kinds of things, and it was just an absolutely incredible experience from one uh, day uh, to the next. Um, uh, like goosebumps. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was incredible. It was just, it was so, it was so neat. I prayed one day. I said, Lord, I'm just tired of walking up, speaking through with the translator. Would you just lead me to somebody who speaks English? And uh, um, through a number of different things that happened, I ended up up on the bleachers, and there was a man named Miguel, uh, Miguel Reyes, um, who spoke really good English. And he, as it turned out, he was a believer, but he was so encouraged by. Um, our talk together. And in fact, he has a son who was looking for a church. And uh, the church that hosted us is about 200 plus people. Um, and most of them, maybe 80% of them were age 15 to 30. And he said to his dad, Miguel said to me, he said, you know, he said, maybe my son would be interested in that church. He said, my son tells me, dad, I want to go to church, but I want to find a church with young people in it. And I said, we are going to believe this, but the church that's hosting us is just primarily young people. And so I don't know what God was doing through all of that, but it was neat to have me led to somebody who, who spoke English, and um, could, uh, uh, he encouraged me, and uh, I encouraged him. Um, i tell you what, there's so many things that were just so different in El Salvador. We were at the airport, and um, on the big screen, as you're walking through the airport, um, was praise music. Uh, Phil Wickham and uh, Carrie Jones were on the big screen everywhere you went in the airport. Um, uh, uh, it praised me. It was just a very different world. Diff odd, because everywhere you went, there were cops with um, shotguns. Mm -hmm. they, every, you know, every significant corner and uh, um, you know, kind of kind of a strange, you know, there's a God consciousness and awareness that, that, that God is real and that we have to follow Him. But at the same time, there was a need for uh, a pretty intense security. But anyway, that, that, those are some highlights of the trip from a country standpoint. But um, what really challenged me, and it's, and it stuck with me, I think, even more, was just seeing the church. And I want to talk about that a little bit this morning. Um, again, I, I am uh, just so excited about what God has in store for us. And this is what I shared with the church on the last day that we were there. Um, we've studied Acts 2 as a church. Um, 3,000 were added to the church that day, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, um, to a fellowship of breaking bread and prayers, and, and, and so on. We'll get that passage through the next couple weeks. Um, but sharing with the church, I said, you know, we, we, we study that passage in America, and we preach on that passage, and we know what it looks like in theory. But I said, I said it, and, and again, people, don't, don't take me wrong. I, I'm so excited about what God is doing here. But we're not yet an Acts 2 church. We're, we're just not there yet, okay? We, we, we want to get there, but we're not there yet. I want to share with them. I said, we studied in America, but I've never seen it. And I shared with that church, I said, but I've seen it now. I've seen what it looks like to be an Acts 2 church. And it's just so different than reading it 
in the Bible, which I know is real and I know it's powerful, but it's so different to actually see what it looks like, to actually see that it can be a reality, um, uh, that, that it's not something that just existed 2,000 years ago, but that God wants to form in us as a body. And so um, uh, having seen it, it just made me very excited. I want to be careful. Um, about uh, using a, a church as an example um, because the church is fallible. Um, and, but I didn't, was able to learn some things. I kept thinking of Paul um, when he was uh, writing to the church in Thessalonica. And uh, uh, Paul writes very differently to the church in Thessalonica than he does to anybody else. Uh, he says some good things to the church in uh, Ephesus, Colossae, of Philippi, he doesn't really have anything good to say, in Cor or very much good to say in the church in Corinth, not a whole lot good to say in the church in Galatia. When he writes to the church in Thessalonica, he says this, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to come back to that text there. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. Do you have that, by any chance? Would you have that up? Um, ESV, sorry, I didn't have on that. Um, you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. So here's the church of Thessalonica. Paul says you became an example to all of the other believers. You, you're the pattern. First Thessalonians chapter one, verse starting with verse two. Uh, for not only <clears throat> has the word of God sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia. But your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. Imagine that. We don't even, we don't even, tell, we don't even need to tell people about you in Thessalonica because your testimony has already gone out through all the world. It's already gone out. And here's what their testimony was. He says, um, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven whom He raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. The testimony of the church in Thessalonica that had gone out through all the world. There was no need to put pamphlets on the doorknobs of their neighbors. There was no need to um, have it on their website and, and proclaim that here's what God is doing in Thessalonica. Their testimony had gone out through all of the world had heard how they had turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. There's so much in just that one verse. But that is God's intention for the church. That is God's intention when He saves somebody. That we would turn to God. That we would turn from idols and that we would turn to God from idols in order that we might serve the living and true God. Do you understand that? Do you understand that that is, in a nutshell, what God is wanting to do in believers when He saves them and as He continues to grow them into the likeness of Jesus Christ? He comes to a person... See, Paul says very clearly to the church here, that's like, listen, God chose you. He chose you. We know Ephesians says before the uh, creation of the world, you've been chosen. And he chose us in order that he would save us to himself from idols in order that we would serve the living God. And I'll tell you what, here's where the church in America seems to break down. It's in one of those three things. And, it's, and, it, and, 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 and that's not an option. It's a package deal. The church in America, many want to turn from idols, perhaps. I'm just going to just make up stuff here as we go. Maybe some want to turn from idols. I knew a guy who just had all kinds of idols in his life. He wanted to turn from them because they were damaging to him. They, they, they were painful. They, they were costly. Um, uh, he didn't want the idols in his life because of how it negatively affected his life. He had no desire whatsoever to turn to God. 
He just wanted to get rid of the idols that were enslaving him. But there was no interest whatsoever in his heart to turn to God. Uh, some say, I want God, and I want to turn to God, whatever that means in their mind, but please don't ask me to turn from my idols because I actually really like those, and I want those to be a part of my life. And some say, listen, I'll turn to God, I'll turn uh, from my idols, but listen, do not ask me to live a life of service to God. That, I, I've got my life, I've got my agenda, I've got my goals. It's not on my radar that the rest of my earthly existence would be lived out in order to serve the living and true God. And yet, here's the problem. In America, that has actually been given a stamp of approval. Any one of those attitudes. You can live like that. You can know Christ, and, and discipleship is an option. You can be saved, but to be a disciple is just an extra add-on if you want it. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that we're saved in order to be a disciple. We're saved. God, God calls us. And, and here, here's, Jen and I were talking about this last night. In America, we say, come just as you are. And, and, and indeed, that's what the scriptures teach. Come as you are. But in America, we forget to add, come as you are with a heart that says, God, I, 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 I repent so that you can change me from what I am to what you want me to be. And in America, it's just come as you are and stay as you are. It's just come as you are, and you never have to change. That's not the gospel. That is an entirely Western civilization, um, uh, add-on, uh, heretic, heretical view of what the scriptures teach. You do not find that in other parts of the world, and you certainly don't find it in El Salvador. In El Salvador, i, I got to tell you, I met person after person. This church started uh, seven years ago with eight people, and they had a little over 200 people. And I, they are on fire. I mean, we, we had at any given time probably 10 um, young people with us, young people, adults, who would kind of travel around with us and just show us the ropes and translate for us. And I started asking their stories. So, so tell me your story. Uh, one uh, young man, uh, Sugar, was his name, Roberto. Um, I can't remember his last name, but they just call him Sugar. Um, uh, Sugar, I, I said, what's your story? Um, he had tattoos all over his arms. Clearly, um, it just probably had an interesting story. He said, well, Rusty, he said, eight months ago, I was a big drug dealer in uh, San Salvador. I speak English and I speak Spanish. So um, if, you have, if you can do that, you usually get a job at a call center um, for direct TV, Dish Network. What we call here, we're actually getting a call center in San Salvador. He said, so I work at a call center. And he said, um, I, I just used my connections in the call center. And I was just a major drug dealer. He said, I came to this church and I found Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, one of the highlights of my trip there was on Monday night, um, they have a prayer service. And I want to talk about that in a little bit, but I'll just tell you this part of it. They're praying. And I walked to the back and I walked past Sugar. Eight months ago, he didn't know who Jesus even was. And there's Sugar at the back of that sanctuary with his hands raised and tears just pouring down his cheeks because he knows Jesus Christ and his life is committed to serving him. And he's actually leaving, he's leaving El Salvador this month to come to Virginia. He's going to be going to Bible college. He says, God's called me full-time service. And uh, uh, story after story after story. But here's what I noticed in that church. And I don't know if it's like this everywhere in El Salvador, but in that church, they teach that to become a Christian is synonymous with becoming a Christ follower. It's not, it's not one or the other or, 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 or just half of the path. When you become a Christian, by definition, you become a Christ follower. You become a disciple of Christ. And I met disciple after disciple after disciple. And in fact, whenever they would share their testimony, they would say something like this, you know, two years ago I came to this church and I didn't know Christ and, and I was doing this and this and going down through their list of things that were part of their former life and I came to know Christ and, and literally in the same sentence and he took this habit away from me and he took this sin away from me and he took this away from me and it was just part of their testimony when they came to Christ that he immediately began this transformation process and, and, and just changed them uh, into the likeness of Jesus Christ. 
And it was just absolutely um, an incredible experience. And that's what happened here in, in, in the church in Thessalonica. And Paul uses them as an example. We don't see that elsewhere in the New Testament. We see this one church where word had spread because they turned from idols to serve the living God, or, or to God from idols to serve the living God. And I just, as I was going through the week, I was just praying and opening up the scripture, understanding of what was going on uh, there in the church. And, and uh, um, as we go through this Acts 2 passage over the next couple weeks, I want to continue to reference this passage here. Because Paul sets them up as an example. He sets them up as a pattern for the New Testament church. And uh, uh, we'll continue to reference that, but that's God's intention. But go back to verse number 3. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, <clears throat> three things, your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Three things, he says. Three things about the church of Thessalonica. You had a work of faith, you had a labor of love, and you had a perseverance or steadfastness that is produced by hope. This is such a powerful um, uh, verse here in 1 Thessalonians. Because, you see, most in the church are willing to commit to a work of faith. Uh, we miss this in our English translation, but in the Greek we would see work, labor, and perseverance. And we would see that they are climatic. They're progressive. Uh, a work is, is the simplest, and a labor is a little bit more intense. And then, of course, perseverance or steadfastness is, I am just all in here. Most of the church are willing to commit to a work of faith. A work because I believe in Christ, because I know Him, because I follow Him. I'm willing to submit to a work of faith. And, and most are, 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 are willing to do that. Some, perhaps not even that. But, um, uh, but that's where most stop. Paul said the church of Thessalonica then went from there, and you no, know, there's... I'm going to do a work of faith here as I serve the living and true God, as I serve the body of Christ. But I want to go a step farther. I want to, I want to have a labor of love. I'm not content to just stop here at uh, taking out the garbage or uh, 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 shaking somebody's hand on Sunday morning. I want to have a labor of love. And, and again, there's a progressiveness here. There's a, um, I'm, I'm more in than I was before. I, I, there's a labor here, a commitment that comes because I love you. Because I'm committed to you. See, the word of faith, I'm a Christian, so I, I'm going to do some things within the body first. But, but now as a Christ Lord, God's pouring me a love for the body. And so I'm going to labor on your behalf. We do that in so many ways. We did it this morning as we prayed for each other. Um, uh, we, we want to be earnestly in prayer for each other, uh, calling each other up. And, and, and we're going to talk about this and break it down in the weeks that follow. Um, but he says, the church of Thessalonica went even farther. And he says, uh, there was a steadfastness. There was a perseverance that was produced by what? By hope. You had a perseverance that came from your hope. You worked. You labored, but you persevered. You, you weren't in it for a little while and then backed off. You weren't in it as long as things were going your way and you were getting the recognition for it. Uh, you were in it for the long haul. Why? Because you had hope. And hope in the New Testament is always an expectation. Because you had an expectation that as, as I uh, commit this work of faith and this labor of love and, the, and this perseverance, it, it, it's going to produce fruit. It's going to produce what God wants it to produce. And so I'm going to hang on here until that fruit is produced. And I think sometimes when I was uh, at a former church, I, my pastor used to tell me, you're so idealistic. And, and it was a negative thing. And, and I always wanted to talk about the Acts 2 church and, and some of these passages. And, and, and boy, what can we do as a leadership to kind of move us in this direction? And his phrase was always, you're so idealistic. You're so idealistic. In other words, just back off. We're not going to aim for that. We're going to shoot a little bit lower because we can actually hit that. Um, but the church of Thessalonica was like, no, no, no. There's a hope here that what God called us to, we actually can, by His grace and by His power, by His Holy Spirit, we actually can achieve it. And so we're going to continue to persevere in each other's lives in our task and an opportunity and privilege of serving the living and true God. We're going to persevere in that because I have an expectation that God, you're going to do something 
And uh, um, so that's why the church in uh, Thessalonica is set up as uh, the example uh, that they are. Um, and, and again, we're gonna, I just want to keep referencing that. I want to tell you, as I was going through the week, and I just wanted to notice things. Um, sometimes my response was, was fear. Sometimes it was, um, wow, God, I think that uh, you're calling me to your Bible church um, corporately, but where Barbara really needs to is individually um, to a whole other level. And that's sometimes fearful because um, we have uh, uh, some cultural things is maybe a good way to put it. Um, in uh, in uh, El Salvador, um, work is not their life. When you come to the Christ Church, it's your life. Uh, work is not your life. And, and I don't know why that is. I don't know if maybe we're, we're cursed with the, 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 um, um, the curse of action being able to succeed financially in the United States. So we can work a little longer or work a lot longer and experience a greater measure of financial success. And so we do that. We're in a Zeno Salvador. You can work. More than that, you're never going to be financially successful, and so they don't bother. And I don't know, I'm just making stuff up, I'm just uh, surmising that that might be the case. I feel like um, the same for Haiti, they're yeah, so poor, it makes they're sense. rich, yeah, exactly, exactly. And so, you know, I found myself at times saying, Boy, God, I, I think that you, you're, you're wanting to do some, some things, we, you, you wanting to grow us as a church, but um, I did find myself at times saying, Well, that's a little bit scary, that's a little bit. Um, for one, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how to get there. I confess that to you. Uh, two, I understand that it can't end with a work of faith or even labor of love, but it goes to a, a perseverance produced by hope. And um, that's just a whole other level. And that's a little scary and a little bit um, a little bit apprehensive about that. But God's going to move us as we allow Him to do that. Um, we'll continue to reference that. I want to wrap this up because I know it's um, uh, Communion Sunday. But I want to talk... Um, um, just a little bit about uh, um, John chapter 2. So John chapter 2, um, you're familiar with the passage, and it's actually a, a John chapter 2 verse 17 is a uh, quote from Psalms chapter 69. The psalmist is the first one that says these words. And in John chapter 2, you're familiar with the story, Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and um, the money changers are in the temple. And uh, uh, they're uh, abusing their um, opportunity to serve the people. And they're taking advantage of them. And they're being dishonest. And we know the story. Jesus comes in. He flips the tables over. And he has a whip. And he, he, you've turned my uh, father's house into a den of thieves. Well, in John chapter 2, verse 17, excuse me, the scripture says that when that happened, the disciples remembered what had been written. And of course, that's Psalm 69. And here's what had been written. Zeal for your house consumes me. Zeal for your house. Why, why did Jesus do what he did today? I mean, it's certainly not a picture of the sign of Jesus that we see often. He's coming in there just like a whip and flipping over tables. And um, uh, we, we, we typically see Jesus as, as healing people and, and a kid up on his lap and so on. Why did he do that? Because the place where God was supposed to dwell was being turned into a place that he called a den of thieves. It was a holy place. It was a place that was supposed to be set apart. It was supposed to be a place of purity and, and, and sacredness. And it was becoming a den of thieves. And, and so zeal for his father's house consumed him. Just as the psalmist said, zeal for your house, God, consumes me. And my prayer this morning... And my prayer um, as I was in El uh, Salvador this week was, God, would you just bring us to a place as a church? I don't know what it looks like. I don't know how we get there. I don't know how to lead this. And, and, and I think as a leadership, we, we would all say the same thing. We don't, we've never seen it uh, in, like in, in here, and, and we don't really know how to get there. But I think it starts with that one prayer. God, would you just give me zeal, a passion for your house, not the temple, not this building. The house of God is where now? 
It's our hearts. God, would you give me a passion that this heart of mine which is where your spirit dwells, that it would be a place that is sacred and holy and set apart, that it would never it would never be able to be said of my heart, that is a place where thieves would be at home. That is a place where dishonesty would feel comfortable. That is a place where impurity could reside. But no, that this home, this place, this temple that is your home would be a place that, that, that God can dwell and be at home. This would be uh, the reality. And so I think that's where it begins. I think it begins with you and I. Not just the leadership, but you and I. God, would you give me a passion for your house? Because when you and I individually get a passion for God's home to be holy, then corporately we have a body of believers that is holy and set apart. And God can use us. I was thinking this week about the church in Philadelphia. Revelation chapter 3. He says, you've not denied my name. You, you've not denied my name. And he says, I've given you an open door. I, I've given you an open door. A, a door that no man can shut, he says. And, and I have to ask the question, okay, all the other churches, sometimes he said good things about them, but he didn't tell anybody else I've given you an open door. Why did he tell the church in Philadelphia, I've given you an open door? And I have to come back to his compliment of that church. You've never denied my name. You've never turned your back. And, and, and listen, it, this, I want you to understand this distinction. He didn't say you never denied me. He says you've never denied my name. And that is a very important distinction. Because his name is who he is. You see, let me illustrate it this way. Let's just say that a guy and a girl are out and about. And maybe this guy has got a wandering eye. And so he meets some girls. This is a terrible illustration, but I don't know how else to illustrate it. He meets some girls. And they happen to notice a little earlier he's with this girlfriend of his. And they say to him, so you're talking with us, but do you know her? And he says, well, yeah, 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 I know her. Has he denied her? No, because he does know her. But the way to not deny her name would be to say, yeah, I know her. That's my wife. Or that's my fiance. Not just recognizing that I know her, but recognizing who she is in my life. The church in Philadelphia did not just, recognize, did not just admit and confess and live as though they knew God. They lived as though they knew God for who He really was. And that is a very important distinction. God, you are God. God, you are sovereign. God, you are the Messiah. God, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. God, you are my Master. You're my Lord. You're my Savior. All of the things that encompass God's, that God's name encompasses, the church in Philadelphia did not deny that. And God says, because of that, I have given you an open door. And as you and I catch this vision and increase in this vision, God, give me a passion for this house that is your, this heart that is your home. Help me never to deny who you are in name or in person. And, and, and I believe God will give us more and more open doors. More and more opportunities to display and, and, to, and to be a witness um, to who he is. Wouldn't it be wonderful if it could be said in the future of church? Guess what? We don't need to tell anybody about you. Because word has gone out through all the surrounding area. How those people in Deerfield Bible Church have turned from idols to serve the living, to God to serve the living and true. God, that's God's intention. That, 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 yes, it's the exception in Scripture, but that's God's intention uh, for you and uh, for me. Um, I, I wrote down on my notes here, uh, some say, uh, Rusty, what you're dealing with in El Salvador is a lot of cultural stuff. It's a different culture, right? And it is. It is. It, it's a different culture. And you know what I wrote after that? God, would you save us from what is cultural? Save us from this culture because it is not doing us any favors. I wrote down a few things. It's cultural to work 80 hours and to never spend time with our kids. I hope that we'll be saved from that cultural norm. It's cultural to watch 30 hours of TV a week. It's cultural to live like we don't need anybody, to live as a loner. It's cultural to say that the truth is relative and relative and that all words lead to God. There are a lot of cultural things that we need to break free from. And one of those is becoming a body that cares about and expresses our needs for each other. It is, it, 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 go back to that chainsaw illustration. 
Um, uh, I mean, we, we're, we're pretty shallow in regards to what's going on in our lives. I mean, becoming a body means I share with you what's really going on, and you share with me. And, and, and becoming a body means that I can get into your business, and you can get into mine. Becoming a body means when I see something in your life, I tell you. And when you see something in my life, you tell me. I mean, those are all hard things. But that's what it means to become the body of Jesus Christ. And it is not loving to do any less than that. And so um, there's so much God wants to do uh, in and through us. Um, here, here's, 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 here's what I think would rubber meets the road. God had this indictment against uh, his people in the Old Testament over and over and over again. He said, you have profaned my name. It sounds like a terrible word. But all that the word profane means is you've made it look ordinary. You've just made it look ordinary. What a terrible thing for the church, for the people of God, to make God look ordinary. We, we want to be a church that the way we live, the way that we love, the way that we minister to each other, the grace that we have for each other, the way that we get involved in each other's lives, that we make the world look on and say, wow, your God is extraordinary. He's not ordinary at all. He's not um, one of the run-of-the-mill uh, gods. I'm going to wrap this up. I want to just share with you a couple more things that were a highlight to me um, throughout the week. Um, uh, Monday night. Monday night. Um, they have church Sunday morning. And then Monday night, they have a prayer service. Wednesday night service and then Saturday night service. Their Saturday night service is called Sabados Specials. Especially how you would say that in Spanish, momentos. And I said, what is that all about? And uh, the pastor's wife said, um, well, most young people on a Saturday night are up drinking and partying. And we call this our Saturday special moment because um, we're here praising Jesus. And so it's a very special moment for us because we used to, we used to be doing what everybody else is doing. And tonight we're here praising Jesus. But Monday night was a highlight for me. Um, they have chairs just like this huge warehouse. I wish this, if there was one moment that I could transport you to, like, transport you to I wish it was, it would be this one. They take all their chairs out. We got there Monday night after ministering throughout the day, and all the chairs were gone. Cool. The church tonight, what's going on? The pastor sat out front and uh, played the guitar straight for an hour. This was their service every, every Monday. Plays the guitar straight for an hour. Sometimes, well, as he's playing, it's just pretty mellow. Um, uh, he's uh, leading them in song. So he, he starts to sing and everybody joins him. For the most part, though, he would finish singing, the congregation would finish singing, and he would just strum. And it was the most incredible thing. No chairs in the room. And people finished singing. And for an hour, for a straight hour, the entire congregation was doing this in, in, in fervent prayer. And, and just praying, and just praying, and walking around this congregation, this, in this warehouse, and just pleading, pleading with God for an hour. Just walking around, and that's why they take the chairs up. Apparently, that's how they pray effectively, if they walk around. I, I get that. I love to hike, or to walk, or to even drive and pray. I, I get it. And, and they just walked around. And then every now and then, they'd be down on their knees, and, and half the group was just pour, pouring Tears pouring down their face because they remember what life was like without Jesus Christ. And it was just incredible. And it was on Monday night that I began to think about Acts chapter 2. Because 3,000 were added to the church that day. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, very much emphasized, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. And I began to get a vision for near the Bible church. And I believe, and this will pick up next week, I believe that God has called us to this four-legged stool of the apostles' teaching, of fellowship, of breaking of bread, and to prayers. And you've heard the illustration of the three-legged stool. Three-legged stool, you have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I mean, you've got to have all three. You lose one, and the whole thing falls apart. It is a four-legged stool, and it's deceptive, because we could take one of these legs out of this chair, and we don't necessarily fall. We're just not quite as stable and strong. We can take a different one out and put the first one back in. We don't necessarily fall. We're just not as effective and strong. 
And I want to talk over the next number of weeks, as long as God leads us here, about these four things that I believe God wants to grow us in. More emphasis. I think you do this well, but I, 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 you know, I know the leadership is committed to the uh, teaching of God's Word. But uh, the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. I believe that that is what God has called the church to. It is what um, is uh, growing that church and what will grow our church. One last thing. It was uh, probably the second biggest highlight. Sunday, we went to church. Uh, there with them, and they called us all up to the front of the congregation um, to just say thank you and to pray for us as we left. I didn't know what they were going to do, but we're all standing up there, 20 of us or so, and uh, the, the one of the translators is telling the group what they're going to do and then telling us what he just told the group. So they were hearing it before us, and we didn't know what they were hearing, but well, we're all standing up there, and all of a sudden, this group of almost 200 people goes like this. I mean, all 200 of them, they go like this. And then he looks at us and he says, we want to pray for you. And we're up there, this group of 20 of us, and in us out of they don't take turns. And you think that it's chaotic, but it's not, it's beautiful. I, a guy came up to me one day on this Monday night, he says, can I pray for you? And I said, yeah, and I said, well, can I pray for you? And he told me. And so I started, I had an and I started to pray for him. And I've got two words in, and he starts praying for me. <laughs> and we're both just praying at the same exact, that's what they do. So, so he says, we want to pray for you. And this guy, Carlos, he starts praying. And all of a sudden, 200 people, with their hands raised toward heaven, begin to pray for us simultaneously. I was almost in tears. I was in tears when I was telling my wife about it. I've never had 200 people pray for me all at once. I don't know, I don't know if anybody's ever prayed for me. <laughs> It was the most beautiful thing that I have ever personally experienced from the body. Two hundred people praying. I don't mean I don't mean a thirty second prayer. It went on and on, praying for us, for our, our journey. God would work in us. I, I don't know all the different, but it was beautiful. And uh, as I said, I'm just so excited about what God wants to do in Dear from Church. And I'll tell you what, I didn't even get to a passage that I want to pick up with next week. But um, I, I, I'll just say this, because I, I, it's, I can't make this point without it. Jesus said to Peter, who do you say that I am? He says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, Peter, he says, you're Peter. He says, upon this rock, which is not Peter, it's upon this confession. He says, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I want to pick up with this next week, but three things. Um, the gates of hell are attempting to prevail. They will not. But the gates of hell are attempting to prevail on the Ephraim of the church. And I know that we have such great potential because I always see signs of the gates of hell attempting to prevail on the church. It's always there. It's always something going on that is typical of the church. That backbiting or gossip or, or, or lack of grace or lack of love, those are the tools that God uses or that the devil uses because they're so effective. Because we're so ready to use them. You know, there's not a person in here that doesn't have some part of us that just likes to be a part of that garbage. And so they're very effective. And I see it happening. And, and, and that's why I know that the, the gates of hell are attempting to prevail against this church. They won't. Um, but God has called us to a greater level of commitment to each other, a greater level of service to turn to God from idols to serve the living God. And uh, <clears throat> I hope in our time here this morning that you've just gotten a little bit excited um, and that uh, we will develop more and more passion for God and more and more passion uh, for each other and that the um, zeal for God's house would consume us. God, we praise you. We praise you in Jesus' name because you have saved us. You have bought us by the blood of Jesus Christ. I praise you because you have given us this wonderful privilege and responsibility to uh, be used by you. Uh, that, that, that right now we could be storing up treasure in heaven 
where moth and rust don't corrupt, where thieves do not break in and steal. Uh, Lord, I pray that it would be our passion that we would just hear those words, well done, uh, good and faithful servant, as you introduce us uh, to those whose lives have been impact, be impacted because uh, we chose to turn to you from idols to serve the living and true God. Lord, make us a people that, that, that is committed to a work of faith, a labor of love, and an endurance that's produced by an expectation of what you're going to do. And God, I don't know, I confess, I don't know how to bring us there. And, and as a leadership, we, uh, I think we're unanimous in that. But God, your, your word says that uh, you give us wisdom, <clears throat> you give it to us liberally, uh, you give it to us uh, generously. And, 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 and God, I, I just want to begin with, would you give us a passion for your house? a passion for these hearts of ours that are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Give us a passion where we are just unwilling to allow compromise or, or, or uh, any kind of um, uh, anything in our hearts that would not make you feel comfortable to live there. God, give us that passion so that we could uh, go from there to allow you to shape us and mold us individually and mold us to shape us as a church. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>